10. A few weeks ago, we started and we looked a little bit in Hebrews chapter 10, which talks of Christ, the once and for all sacrifice, the only one. This is the Christmas season as we're winding it down, if you will, what we consider in our culture the Christmas season, but... As we've seen the last few weeks, Christmas is the coming one, the Redeemer of the world, coming in His own incarnation as a child to one day grow and to make His way to the cross, to die on the cross, to shed His blood, to resurrect three days later. To redeem many back to himself. And in Hebrews, the interesting about, thing about Hebrews is many people kind of shy away from Hebrews. It does, at times, can be force you to dig a little bit deeper. But Hebrews is the author, his main thrust is in all of Scripture. But in Hebrews, in such a unique way, is to drive home the fact that Jesus Christ is the Redeemer of the world. And He does that immediately in chapter 1. And we looked at chapter 1 probably about three weeks ago as we were in chapter 1, three, four weeks ago, and, and then jumped our way to chapter 10, but... The thrust in Hebrews is to announce that Christ is the one and only sacrifice. There will never be a need for another. For He is truly the Redeemer of the world. Remember last week and the prior week, I think it was maybe, it talked about, we looked how in the Old Testament, what we consider what we call the Old Testament today, the old system, under the law of Moses, the sacrificial system, we've seen it was repeated again and again, year after year, as they sacrificed animals to provide some sort of perfect cleansing for those who come to worship but we've seen how the sacrifices, if it was a one-time sacrifice, it would have stopped, but it had to be done over and over and over again. Because it was never a one-time sacrifice. The only one-time sacrifice, never to be done again, would come through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross. He would offer His body as a one-time offering as He come to do the will of the Father. He's the high priest. The high priest offering Himself up as a single sacrifice for all those who would believe. And then we've seen that he would sit down after it was all done. He would sit down in his place of honor at the right hand of the Father. Nothing else would be needed to be done. Unlike the high priests in the Old Testament where they would constantly stand over and over and over again in review from what we learned they would always have to stand over and over and over again and offering sacrifices for the sins of mankind. But not Christ. In verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 10, under the old covenant, the priest would stand and minister before the altar day after day. He would offer the same sacrifices again and again. He sacrificed his 
could truly never take away sin, but our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sin, good for all time. And then he would sit down in a place of honor at the right hand of his Father. There would never be another need to offer any more sacrifices as you see in verse 18 of Hebrews chapter 10. But listen to what it says as we pick up this morning in Hebrews 9, chapter 10 verse 19. And so dear brothers and sisters, we boldly, we can boldly now enter heaven's most holy place because of what? Because of the blood of Christ. Because of the blood of Jesus. Now all who believe can come into the presence of God because of what Jesus has did. All of us. If you go back to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 1 through 8, the first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place of worship here on earth. There was literally two rooms in a tabernacle. In the first room stood a lampstand and a table Sacred loaves of bread on the table. This room was called the holy place. Then there was a curtain. Behind the curtain was the second room. The curtain separated the holy from the most holy place. In that room was a gold incense altar and a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant. Which is covered with gold on all sides. Inside the Ark was a gold jar containing manna. Aaron's staff that sprouted leaves and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of divine glory which wings stretched out over the ark's cover, the place of atonement. But we really cannot explain these things in detail now the writer saying. When these things were all in place, the priests regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties, but only the high priest ever entered the most holy place and he only did this once a year. He always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. But these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as a tabernacle under the system is represented was still in use. This is an illustration pointing to the present time. For the gifts and the sacrifices that the priests offered are not able to cleanse the consciousness of the people who bring them. In other words, Christ, when He came, when Christ came, He was a one-time sacrifice. And the writer says now in verse, 10, in verse 19 of chapter 10, And so, dear brothers and sisters, now we can boldly enter into the most holy place where the high priest could only come, could only go. But now we can. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus. We can boldly enter in because of what Christ has done. Because of Him. It's not about what the high priest has done. It's not about what the priest did in the first room. It's about what the ultimate high priest done, the Lord Jesus. It's about what He done. That we can boldly move about. The curtain has been removed. and we boldly come before not in anything we've done, but in all because of what Christ has done. All because of Him. You live and move and have your being because of Him. He's far greater than the angels. Remember we learned that back in Hebrews chapter 1. He's far greater than them. He's far greater than anything. It's Christ. Christ said it before until you study the sacrificial system of what we call the Old Testament today you will truly never understand what is meant by the curtain mentioned in verse 20 so the writer in verse 19 of Hebrews 10 writes as sort of an encouragement and so dear brothers and sisters as he's speaking to the other believers <clears throat> 
as he's speaking to the other believers, he's saying, we can boldly now enter into the most holy place, not because of what we have done, but because of what Christ has done. By his death. By his death. Remember, never to take what Jesus did on the cross for granted and forget it. Remember Christ. Remember His death. Remember His shed blood. Remember what He has done. Remember it when you rise. Remember it when you lay down at night. Remember it when you're moving through your day. Remember that you're a privileged person to even be able to come into His house and worship Him. Remember that you only believe because He's given you the ability to believe. It's all because of Him. Your salvation's because of Him. You had nothing in it. And that's what the writer in Hebrews is saying in verse 20 and 19. He's saying, Dear brothers and sisters, this is never about you. This was never about you. But this was about Him. It's about what He done. It's about His death. By Jesus' death, Jesus opened a new life, giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. It's about Christ. It's about the path to eternal life. The writer is saying, make no mistake about it. This is about the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse, verse 23 and 24, real quick. Listen to what it says, or 22. 1 Peter chapter 2, it's literally the next book or so over, next letter or so over in 1 Peter. Verse 21. He never sinned, nor he ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He carried our sins in his body on the cross, so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By His wounds, by His death, you are healed. By His wounds, His death, you are healed. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22 down to 25. Even Peter gets in on it, of course. Peter says he's never sinned, nor did he ever deceive anyone. He was perfect. He never would retaliate. He never threatened revenge when he suffered much. He always left his case into the hands of the Father. He judges fairly. And he personally carried our sins as Peter, as Peter is writing to the believers. Remember, he, Peter also is writing this letter to the believers and he says, as he carried your sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. By his wounds we are healed. Not what we have done, but what Christ has did, Peter is saying. Now listen to what he says. This is how we all once were. We all were like sheep. Wandering away. We all were like sheep and we wandered. Aimlessly in this sinful world. We wandered aimlessly, with nowhere to go, 
We wandered around aimlessly with no direction. The lost. You wonder why the lost act the way the lost acts in the world in which we live? It's because they wander around aimlessly. They have nowhere to go. They know nothing. They know nothing of redemption. It's only until Christ chooses to open their eyes as that's what He chooses to do will they ever see the glory of Christ. He says, we were once like that. Peter was once like that. Peter once wandered aimlessly. You once wandered aimlessly. I once wandered aimlessly. But it wasn't until we turned to our shepherd, to the Redeemer of the world, Peter is saying, to the guardian of our souls, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. And that's why one of the reasons the writer back in Hebrews, whoever he was, is saying, dear brothers and sisters, wow, we can boldly now come into the presence of Christ because of His death, because of what He's done, because of who He is. That's the only way. That's the only way. Man will never come to the Father, but only through the Son. Only through Christ. The hymns we sung this morning, both of them, point it directly to the glory of Christ. Point it directly to His glory. You know, look at your life this morning. Is your life a life that represents the glory of Christ? Is your life a life that chooses to, to worship and to glorify Christ? Like I said before, don't take for granted who you are. You are who you are because of Christ. Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5, the very familiar passage of Scripture that talks about what? That talks about Christ. It talks about the shed blood of Christ. It talks about who He is and His glory. It was for our weaknesses He carried. It was our sorrows that weighed Him down. And we thought His troubles were a punishment for God, a punishment for His own sins. But He was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. As Peter said in 1 Peter, Isaiah says the prophet, all of us like sheep have gone astray or have strayed away. Or I should say, as Isaiah said, Peter says, since Isaiah would have said it 700 or so years prior. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord God laid on him the sins of us all. And then it goes on down through there and talks about the glory, and talks about what Christ has done. In Isaiah 53. This past Sunday, last week, we celebrated Christmas. And people got their presents, got what maybe they wanted and didn't get what they wanted, however you want to look at it. Some got nothing, some got a lot. I pray that you didn't miss what it was about. For it was about this Jesus that we read of this morning. It's about Him. His glory, His honor. For as verse 21 of Hebrews chapter 10 says, because He is the great high priest. Listen what it says, and since we have a great high priest, 
That's an assurance. That's an assurance. You see, what do you mean? Since we have, he says, since we have a great high priest. Those that are of the faith have a great high priest. Remember who he's writing to. Make a point when you read Scripture, make a point when you read the Bible to place yourself and to understand what in the world is going on. Don't just cherry pick a piece of Scripture or a verse of the Bible and just run with it and, and, and completely take it out of context. Listen to what the writer is saying. Since we have a great high priest, he's speaking directly to those who are of the faith. Who rules over God's house. We have a great high priest over the house of God. It's Him. It's Christ. In Hebrews 9, 11, So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. Listen, even Moses, Abraham, Sarah, all of them, all the Old Testament ones, that have ever believed, all come to faith the same way. Through Christ. All the same way. There's never another way. There's never a God of the Old Testament when you see so much, you hear so much of that today. You hear people from time to time, and I've made mention this in the past. I don't like the God of the Old Testament, but I like the God of the New. Well, I'm sorry, but the God of the Old is the God of the New. It always has been, always will be. He's the great high priest. Now listen to what the writer says in verse 22. Now let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts fully trusting Him. May we go right into the presence of this holy God with a sincere heart fully trusting Him. May we do that. We have that privilege to come and do that. That's what Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 says. You notice we've been in Hebrews a lot this morning. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. The writer of Hebrews is saying this. Let us hold tightly to the things we've been taught, the things of Christ. Let us hold tightly to Him. Since we have a great high priest, and we do, we just got done seeing that in Hebrews chapter 10. And you see that even at the beginning of Hebrews. Since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. Don't be wavering. May your faith be sure. May your faith be steadfast. May your faith be solid in the things of Christ. For this high priest, he talks of, he understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same testings we do, yet he never sinned one time. Just like it says in Hebrews chapter 10, here it's saying in Hebrews chapter 4, now let us come boldly, now let us come boldly to the throne of the gracious God. Let us come boldly to the throne. There we will receive mercy. There we will receive the mercy of Christ. We will find grace to help us. You will find grace to help you when you need it the most through the power of Jesus Christ. For He is our High Priest. Priest.
One writer said, My son is not a distant priest as he was speaking of God the Father. He said, My son is not a distant priest who is untouched by your feelings and weaknesses. For he is strong and he cares deeply about you, his child. That is Christ, isn't it? That's him. The writer says, Let us come boldly before before that throne. Let us come boldly before Him. Let us go right into the presence of God, fully trusting Him. Where is your trust this morning? Where is your trust? Is your trust in the things of Christ? Is your trust in Him? Is your trust in what Christ has done? Is your trust in yourself? The writer is saying, let us fully trust Him and what He has done. Not what we have done. For what we have done gains us nothing. but heartache and pain, suffering. But let us go right into the presence of the Almighty God with the heart of sincerity, fully trusting Him. Because our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. To make us clean. In 1 John chapter 1, 1 John 1, 5 through 8, there's a reference of something similar to this. This is 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from Jesus and now declare to you that God is light and there is no darkness in Him at all. So we're lying if we say that we have fellowship with God but go on living in spiritual darkness. We're not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light as God is light, then we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us all from sin. It's the blood of Christ. It's Him. It's His death on the cross. It's the blood that He shed that cleanses us. It's what he's done. Him being the one time, the once and for all sacrifice. The no need for another. It's Christ. That's what the writer of 1 John was saying, the same thing. He hasn't erred in a different direction or turned in a direction unlike other parts of Scripture. He's saying the same thing. It is of Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of the world. It's of Him. It's of Christ. Our bodies have been washed. Our bodies have been washed pure. With that of Christ. Hebrews 9.22 Without the shedding of blood, there will never be forgiveness of sin. Speaking of the Old Testament, but yet directly pointing to the ultimate shedding of the blood, Christ Himself, who Christ is, Now listen, let us, let us hold tightly, it says in verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. 
For he who promised is faithful. It's he who promised and it's he who's faithful. Things will come into your life and it's, it's, it's going to test your faith. It's going to test who you are really quick. Things are going to come into your life, whether it comes to you directly or it comes to your children and then finds its way back to you or your grandchildren and finds its way back to you or your spouse or to a close friend or however you want to look at it. Things are going to come into your life that's going to test you. It's going to test you. Or whether it's persecution, it's going to test you. It's going to test you as to how tight you are holding on. How tightly you are gripping on to the hope of Christ. The writer in Hebrews is saying just that. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep His promise. For God can be trusted to keep the promises that he said. He even mentions, the writer even mentions, as you move on down in the 30s of Hebrews chapter 10, he talks about some of the public ridicule and some of the beatings that they had to endure, some of the sufferings that they had to endure, the jail time that they had to endure. He's reminding them to keep the faith. To keep the faith that was given to them through Christ. To keep it. To hold it tight. To hold it close to us. To never let it go. To never let it slip. To not just close to ourselves, but to be an encouragement to one another. This is what he says in verse 24. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. To be an encouragement to one another. Don't be as what we call today the, the, the Debbie Downer or whatever other terminologies they use. But to stimulate one another to love and to good deeds. Stimulate each other. He's talking about here directly. He's talking about here, as you as you imagine, just mentioned just a few minutes ago. There was much persecution going on at this day and time, and he's telling them, he's saying, "Listen, I know the persecution's real. I know it's tough, but we know that we need to lift one another up, to care for one another, to stimulate one another." unto service of Christ, unto good works, unto His glory, unto His honor. I know it's tough. But we need to do such a thing. But we need to do such a thing. Now listen to 25. Listen to 25. This opens up 25 of Hebrews chapter 10 so much let us not ever neglect our meetings together as some people do let us never neglect our worship together as some do let us let that never be said of us let that never be said of us. Let us never forsake our assembling together. Why? Why such a thing? Why mention that now? Because listen, if encouragement is going to be given to one another, if encouragement is going to be given to one another, there's never encouragement given to one another 
in such a depth, in such a, de- in such a degree, in such a way as when the believers of Christ are in together as one group in one building under one tree or in one cave or however you want to look at it, coming together in corporate worship for the glory of the Most High God. He's saying, listen, let us never take that for granted. From time to time you'll hear believers that are going through much and but rarely darken the house, the doors of God's house, if you will. You can only encourage so much over the phone. But there's something that speaks volumes when you come together corporately together in the worship of the Most High God. He says, now let us never neglect our assembling together. As some do. He says, I know some do. But at great cost, at great peril, encourage one another when doing this. Especially now that the day of His return is drawing nigh. The day is coming. The day of His return. Encouragement is a great comfort. Encouragement is a great comfort. It's a great strength. It's what we all need. But there's nothing like coming together corporately and receiving it for one another. Never has been, nor ever will be. And the writer of Hebrews is saying just that. He said, listen. In this day and time, there was no telephones. And like he could pick up the phone and give him a, a voice of encouragement. But he knew and he understood. He knew and he understood the power of coming together with other believers with one mind, with one direction, in one faith, for the glory of Christ. He got that. He understood it. And he longed to see, and he longed to see the others within the church get that also. So you pick that up back in verse 24. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. The author here in Hebrews has a care for the church. He has a care for the church. He has a care for the believers. He has a care for those of Christ. He has an overwhelming care for them. No matter how tough it gets, his care for them is it's it's always there. And, and like I said, you see that. You see that in verse, verse 24. Paul made mention something similar. We've looked at this in the past in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Now I've mentioned this a few times. I guess I mentioned it a few times because it's just amazing that the man went through so much. But yet in verse 28, as he mentions all that he goes through, all that he went through, he says, I still had this care of the church. In verse 28 of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I still had the care of the church. I still had the care of the people. I still called them to persevere. I still longed for them to stay true to the word, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 28. It's an amazing testimony. Besides all those things I've been through, besides all the beatings, besides all the thirstings, besides all the fastings, all the imprisonments, everything I've been through, Paul says, I still had in verse 28 of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I still had this overwhelming care for the church. And you see something similar, very similar in Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 24. 
As the author directly says, let us think ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Do not neglect our meeting together. Some people do. But encourage one another, especially now in the day of his returning. Draws nigh. For that's what we should do. For that's what we're called to do. As we close this morning, this is a call to persevere into the glory of Christ. It's a call to persevere into His glory for who He is, our Lord, our God. I pray that you see that this morning. I pray that you see in all that Christ did, all that Christ did was to bring glory to the Father, to redeem you, This was done. His perfect life, His death on the cross, His blood, His resurrection. It's all of Christ. It's none of us. So I pray that you continuously trust in His promises and what He's promised for His glory, for His glory alone, for He alone is the Lord of Lords, for He alone is the King of Kings. And as Hebrews has said, the writer of Hebrews has said several times in the little book of Hebrews, for He is the great, the great High Priest. The great High Priest. Never will there be another let us pray for father lord we love you and we thank you and praise you for all that you do to you goes the glory and the honor thank you for your word this morning for what it means for what it says its depth its power its convicting May we learn from it. May we apply it back to our lives. May you be glorified. As we partake of this communion table this morning, Lord, may we remember what it's about. For what you have done for us. As we've seen this morning, talked a little bit about your, your death on the cross, your shed blood, your resurrection. And Father, Lord, may you be glorified through it. May we never take this communion table for granted. May we do it. The heart of love and the heart of thanksgiving to you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.